Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming today uh, for, the, uh, for the political economy panel. My name is Joseph. I'm the director of the panel. And here today with us with Professor Rana Mehta, who is a professor of the history and politics of modern China at Oxford University. Uh, he's also a fellow of St. Cross College at the University of Oxford. He's the author of several books, including Forgotten Ally, China's World War II, which won the 2014 RUSI and Duke of West Westminster's Medal for Military Literature, and was named the Book of the Year by the Financial Times and Economist. And here today, he will share with us his latest book, uh, China's Good War, How World War II is Shaping a New Nationalism. Uh, and he'll be sharing a few ideas from the book. Good morning, uh, Dr. Mehta. Thank you for joining us. Right. Um, <clears throat> well, nice to speak to you all. And um, I see that um, we've got, um, as I know, it's Sunday morning uh, in the United States, um, a fairly select group with us. So what I might do is speak with some PowerPoints, maybe a few minutes. And then I think it might be more fun, actually, with, with the small groups that we've got here to just um, open up to a bit more kind of question and answer yeah. uh, session in that sense. So I'll talk a little bit about my book and then... Uh, very happy to talk about that, but if there are other issues to do with uh, China's relations with the world or wider issues, we can certainly have a little time to, to think about, uh, about that as well. Okay, let me try sharing my screen. From the beginning. Okay, let's see. Okay. All right. Well, what I'd like to basically give folks as a, a take home from today is the idea that, as in many other countries in the world, the United States certainly amongst them, the United Kingdom being another um, good example, events that took place more than three quarters of a century ago, the Second World War still remain a very important part of the national culture in various ways. You can see it in the United States. If you go down south to New Orleans, where the National Museum of World War II is, uh, finds itself. And then um, we find ourselves also, I think, um, here in the UK, in a situation where actually the period when Winston Churchill was prime minister, the Blitz was happening, all of this uh, still sits very much in the national culture here in Britain. What I think is often not well known in the outside world is that the continuing collective social memory of World War II is also a factor when it comes to uh, China. And um, I know that from what I've seen here that you have a mixture of um, folks listening in who are yourselves from China. You may well know more about this, I suspect, and maybe a few who are more from the West. And perhaps that's something that hasn't been uh, as obvious, uh, obvious to you. But let me give you a couple of examples of what it is that I'm talking about in terms of uh, this. One, to me, very interesting blog on this subject um, comes from the early 2010s, just over a decade ago, year 2010, when in the United States, um, a big uh, TV series, The Pacific, uh, run by HBO, was um, basically put um, online uh, as part of the um, actions of the Hollywood uh, power team of Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks, two very powerful actors. And this was one of the attempts of the um, Hollywood um, studios uh, through HBO, I, I guess, to um, put out some picture of the American presence in the Pacific War during um, World War II. Um, it was a 10-part series, pretty successful at the, at the time. Now, in the same year, this movie was released in China, the movie Dong Feng Yu, East Wind Rain starring Fan Bingbing, amongst others, who would go on, as I'm sure you know, to become one of China's best-known uh, movie stars. And uh, this movie tells the story of a, um, um, a fictional, although you know, quite, quite uh, excitingly described, um, intelligence operation in which agents of the Chinese Communist Party, in this case, uh, find out about the attack on Pearl Harbor that's upcoming. Uh, through uh, their their um, underground sources in Japanese intelligence. They try and let President Roosevelt know, but for whatever reason, the Americans don't listen to them, and the attack on Pearl Harbor happens anyway. So in some ways, it's quite a, a, a kind of um, China-oriented piece of um, uh, cinema, uh, cinematic um, entertainment with a certain sort of propaganda element to it. But the reason I show you these two, the um, American TV series, The Pacific, 
and the uh, East Wind Rain movie is that they were commented on at the time. I'm going to stop share for a second and just read you a little extract here. They were commented on the time by one of China's best known uh, bloggers, uh, who uh, some of you may know of if you have uh, observed Chinese social media uh, and any length, uh, uh, a man who goes under the blogging name of Sima Pingbang, quite well known leftist um, blogger in, in China. And he and his co-author in a blog in that same year, in 2010, wrote a piece called, Why are China and the United States both rewriting the history of the Pacific War? And analyzing both fictional works, they detect a wider discourse in both countries to claim a political legacy, a political um, source of legitimacy from those World War II years. And they look at these two shows or this movie from China and this uh, TV serial from the United States. And they argue that, in their words, the release of these two films is not just about their plots or their performances. Rather, just as the United States lets the world know that at a most dangerous time for humanity, it bore burdens and made sacrifices. So China has finally dared to propagate in the same way that during the war, it also bore burdens and sacrifices. They say this represents another type of continuity of competition over politics, economics, and culture of these two countries. Now, I think that last phrase really gets to the heart of where we are today in terms of the relationship between the United States and China, that, as they put it, competition over politics, economics, and culture of these two countries. And bear in mind that that was written something like 12 years ago. And if anything, it's become more accurate rather than less accurate in uh, the dozen years or so since then. And what I want to suggest today is that the changing social memory of the World War II experience is one, just one, but one of the important tools, vehicles, narratives, whatever term you want to use for it, that in some ways explains the way in which contemporary international relations in China is um, defined. And in some ways, the most famous aspect of that use of World War II in the contemporary era is China's relationship with Japan. And I think it's well known to everyone in this audience that maybe that relationship is, um, as you might say, a uh, quite troubled one that China and Japan often have um, a fairly active economic relationship with each other, but the political relationship could be much more problematic. But I think what's less well known is that at least some of the important framing of the China-US relationship also draws on that historical um, experience, as well as China's claims in the wider international, um, uh, international community. So let me give an example or two of what I mean by that. Let's get to the, whoops, let's get to the share the screen again. Uh, here we go. Okay. Yeah. Let's try that. Okay. So to explain what I mean, I just have to spend a minute or so explaining the devastating effect that the World War II period had on China. And again, those of you from China or have spent, expense, uh, have spent um, extensive time in China may already know a certain amount about this. But those perhaps who haven't had that experience may know less about this particular episode in, in history. So in World War II in China, you have, first of all, the longest single theater of war during World War II of any of the Allied powers. The, the war breaks out in full form in China in 1937, not 1939, as in Europe. And it ends, of course, in 1945 with the Soviet invasion of Manchuria and the atomic bombings by the United States of Japan in the summer of 1945. Even now, we don't still have a kind of full picture of exactly how many deaths were um, suffered during that period. But something like uh, 8 to 14 million or even more uh, attributable to war is certainly a reasonable figure to look at. Bearing in mind, you have to count horrific events such as the famine in Henan province, which killed something like 4 million people during those years as one you know, event on its own. 
Um, you also have massive refugee flight in China during this period. Between eight, 80 to 100 million refugees become uh, have to flee their homes uh, in this time. And at a moment where, as you're all aware, we're seeing the horrific effects of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, where many similar things are happening, Milli uh, thousands of deaths and many, many uh, millions, uh, four or five million in this case, Ukrainians being forced to flee their homes, in some ways seems very familiar, chillingly familiar, when you look at what happened to China in the 1930s. Again, like Ukraine, a country that was invaded through no fault or request of its own. Um, during those years also, it's worth noting that China held down something like half a million or more Japanese troops during that period when many people expected them to surrender and fail. And again, the parallels with Ukraine are very clear, where it was clear that Putin's invasion was premised on the idea that Ukraine would collapse very quickly, just as Japan's invasion of China in the 1930s was based on the, as it turned out, entirely mistaken idea that China's defenders, the nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek, uh, in an uneasy alliance with the communists under Mao Zedong, the Japanese felt that these forces were weak, undersupplied, and would fall very quickly. It didn't turn out that way. Nonetheless, China suffered very grievously during the wartime years. And it's fair to say that the experience of World War II was a highly, highly traumatic one for China, many of whose, uh, many of the experiences of which still resonate today. But the World War II experience did also provide events and examples that could be drawn on in a more contemporary period. And to understand that, we need to come to some of the other figures who have shaped the story in more, more recent years. That's uh, Chiang Kai-shek, I mean, of course, uh, the generalissimo leader of China between the 1920s and 1940s. He then had to flee to Taiwan when he lost the Civil War and lived on in Taiwan until the uh, 1970s. And he was the leader of China at a time when many of the moves that brought China during World War II into international society in a way that is still very relevant today began to happen. So you see here the signing ceremony for the United Nations Charter. And no less a figure than Chinese President Xi Jinping and the, the Foreign Minister Wang Yi like to say very frequently, remind listeners, particularly from the West, that not only was China the first signatory to the uh, United Nations Charter, but it was also the, uh, sorry, not only was it a signatory, it was the first signatory. In other words, in uh, alphabetical order, so to speak, the uh, Chinese got to sign that first. And that's the basis of the narrative on which today's China, the People's Republic, is very keen to stress its role as a central keystone member of the United Nations order. What's worth remembering, of course, is that that process started under the predecessor, sorry, uh, yeah, Chiang Kai-shek. In other words, Chiang Kai-shek, Jiang Jieshu, was still president of China during that time when the United Nations was, uh, was, uh, was formed. And the majority of people signing off the uh, charter in San Francisco at the opening ceremony of World War II, uh, opening ceremony of the United Nations, were, of course, um, members of the Guomindang, the Chinese Nationalist Party, people like Sun Tzu Wen, but also one member of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, Dong Bi Wu, who would go on to become president of the People's Republic of China in the 1970s. So both a Guomindang nationalist and a Chinese communist presence were there at the founding of the United Nations in 1945. And this points out some of the complexities in those stories about what exactly the meaning of World War II is, one in which both um, of the warring parties that would shape the civil war in China immediately afterwards actually both had a, uh, had a role. So how do, we get to, how do we get to where we are today? Well, one of the things that's worth noting is that during most of the years under Mao Zedong, the high years of Chairman Mao and his ruler, rule, rule over China, the fact that a very large contribution to the uh, defeats of Japan was brought about by the Guomindang, the nationalists, was not mentioned very extensively in Mao's <coughs> China. It was politically far too difficult for Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communist Party to acknowledge any positive contribution by the Guomindang and by the uh, Chiang Kai-shek nationalists during that period. Now, that began to change in the 1980s when Jiang Jishu, Chiang Kai-shek, Mao Zedong had both died and also 
China was seeking to recover from the horrors of the Cultural Revolution, looking for a more kind of patriotic narrative that it would, enab would enable it to um, uh, uh, you know, create a more unified sense of national identity across political divides, rather than this very violent class struggle, which shaped the Cultural Revolution during that order. So bringing about a collective memory of World War II and China's shared resistance against the Japanese during that period became a really important part of that story. But it couldn't have happened if some of the really top people in the Chinese Communist Party hadn't signed off on it, hadn't agreed that they would be willing to support this change in historical direction. And one of those who did that was this gentleman you see right here on the picture, uh, Hu Qiamu. Who is Hu Qiamu? Hu Qiamu was many things. First of all, he was one of the most kind of dedicated central members of the Chinese Communist Revolution. He was a personal secretary to Mao Zedong. He had been on a long march. He was an absolute hardcore ideologue in terms of his commitment to the Chinese communist cause. But he was also a historian. Uh, he wrote quite a few of the kind of standard communist histories of China in the early part of the Mao era. And then when it came to the reform era, after Mao had died, when Deng Xiaoping was opening up China, he also pushed very strongly for a new version of history in which, to put it in its most basic, it wasn't going to be just 1949 that was the starting point for modern Chinese history. It was going to be 1945 as well. Okay, what do I mean by that? How, how does that work? Let me explain a little bit. 1949, even now, I think it's fair to say, but certainly through the vast majority of the, pe the period of the People's Republic of China, has always been seen as the starting point where you know history ends and the kind of present day begins. In other words, the founding of the People's Republic of China, the official establishment of communist China, that is the moment at which the, the switch flips and the world in which communist China has a prominent role begins. That's not a particularly surprising statement. I think you all surely will know that. But that means that until relatively recently in China, there has been a significant downplay of a date which has, in general terms, and certainly for those who look at international society and international relations, really been a more dominant turning point date. And that date is 1945. In other words, the end of World War II, peace in Europe and Asia, finally, after years of devastating war, and the establishment of an international order, Bretton Woods, that provided a new kind of economic order, the establishment of institutions such as the Warsaw Pact, NATO, the Soviet Union versus the United States, all of that dates from 1945 onwards. But traditionally, China hadn't done very much to concentrate on that date of 1945, because, of course, 1945 to 49 is the era of the Chinese Civil War, when both sides, the nationalists and communists, are fighting each other. Eventually, the communists come to victory in 1949 and want to sort of reinvent China at that point. So for a long time, they would be saying, well, why would we want to think about 1945? Why is that interesting to us? And the answer becomes, because actually some of the things which have become of importance to China today, as it becomes a global power, actually date from that greater involvement of China with the post-1945 world than they do just with this rather inward-looking story of the rebirth of China through a communist revolution in 1949. In other words, there are many aspects of the world created by the old Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party, that today's Communist Party wants to draw on. What kind of things am I talking about? Well, just to be clear, Hu Qiamu, who I've got a picture of here, is one of the people who is arguing quite strongly in Chinese propaganda um, uh, vehicles, such as the People's Daily, the Ramin Ruba, in the 1980s that actually China should do more to be thinking about those immediate post-war years uh, when China was involved in uh, events such as the Tokyo trial, the trial of Japanese war criminals in Tokyo in 1948, when there was a Chinese judge, Mei Ruo, who was sent as one of the judges who would basically you know, pass sentence on Japanese war criminals. But because he was a judge sent by the nationalists, by the Guomindang, not by the communists, for a long time his role hadn't been acknowledged. And the shift that people like Hu Qiaomu as top communist ideological leaders were pushing forward from the 1980s onwards, opened up space for that to happen. 
But this wasn't just being done by any means because the Chinese Communist Party thought that a more accurate view of historical understanding of the recent past was a good idea. The Chinese Communist Party then and now is very keen to keep control of history to make sure that its reading of history backs up the, the story of the party's rise to power. It also helps the party to make particular claims in terms of its own maritime and uh, territorial claims. So let's have an example of, of how that might happen. Here's a picture of a historical event, which will be known to at least some of you, I'm guessing, the Cairo Conference of November 1943. And this event um, was one of the kind of major wartime conferences. There were a lot of them that were held during World War II, mostly involving the President of the United States. You see there in the middle, Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of the British Empire. I mean, most other of these meetings, I don't know, have been just the two of them, or there would have been Stalin, the Soviet leader, uh, not present here because, of course, the Soviet Union was neutral against Japan for most of World War II until the very end. But these other two figures here are not Stalin. They are on the left-hand side, as we see it, uh, Chiang Kai-shek. And on the right-hand side, Madame Chiang Kai-shek, Su Meiling, his wife, and a very important English-speaking advocate of China's cause to the wider world. And this was symbolically a very important moment because it was the first moment that a Chinese leader, sovereign leader, would sit in equal standing with the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of the British Empire in a public space. So symbolically, this photograph is very, very important. But there's also another reason, a more practical one, why this Cairo conference had significance, which was at the end of the conference, a, um, a communique, a document, was signed by the major leaders, FDR, Winston Churchill, Chiang Kai-shek, saying that when the war was over, Japan would be compelled to give up islands that it had seized since World War I and which uh, had been taken in as part of its empire. And apart from the home islands of Japan, all the other islands would have to be handed over to the Republic of China or their rightful, um, rightful owners. Now, this has proved in later days to be a quite controversial, but politically useful statement to have made in 1943. And you can see that nearly 10 years ago in 2013, and you may see it again next year in 2023, when today's Chinese communist media and authorities put forward a strong claim that a particular set of islands, uh, known in Chinese as Jiaoyu, in Japanese as Senkaku, they sit halfway between the Chinese mainland and the Japanese islands in the middle of the East China Sea. And China argues that the communique signed in 1943 at the end of this Cairo conference and their statements about giving back islands to China basically means that China has the right to those islands today. Now, you may agree or disagree with this position. International lawyers have been arguing about it for a, for a long time. At the moment, the islands are under Japanese sovereignty, and I think it's unlikely that they're going to, to change, but you can make your own call about the justice of that. What to me is interesting is that to make this claim fly on the Chinese side, for China to be able to make a legitimate claim in the first place that you should even think about this, they have to acknowledge that Chiang Kai-shek, the enemy who was defeated by Mao on the mainland in 1949, actually had a legitimate claim to the islands when he signed that communique in 1943. In other words, today's Chinese government has to make a simultaneous claim that Chiang Kai-shek's government was not really legitimate in the end, which is why it was appropriate for the communists to defeat them on the mainland in the civil war. But at the same time, that the same government, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist government, was also legitimate in the sense that it could make demands for post-war territorial settlement. Now, during the time when Chiang Kai-shek was not really acknowledged as a wartime people in China before the 1980s, none of this really came up. But today, over and over again, there is a sort of ambiguity on the part of today's Chinese leadership, which wants both to acknowledge the non-communist nationalist resistance to China. Nationalism, even though uh, it was fought by non-communist uh, leaders, but also at the same time argue that still the ultimate victory of the Chinese Communist Party in 1949 
was a legitimate and necessary turning point for Chinese history. And so World War II complicates the picture from the point of view of the party today, because it wants both to acknowledge it as a sort of building block for all Chinese, not just for communists, but at the same time also doesn't want to break up the narrative of its own rise to power from the year 1949. Nonetheless, no countries, and that would include you know, the European Union, uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, wherever you want to name it, are always entirely consistent in terms of their international uh, positioning of their, their ideas and their policy. And certainly in the case of the Cairo uh, Declaration, there is a very strong case that China has been very willing to try and push its case, not just in the diplomatic chamber, not just using these historical examples, but also in terms of popular culture. And one example of that in the year 2015 was the movie Kailo Xue Yuan, the Cairo Declaration, which is a sort of adventure story, uh, quite romantic version of the signing of that communique in Cairo in 1943 um, with all of these actors. But even there, there was some peril, you might say, from the Chinese authorities, point of view, at least from those making the movie. Um, you'll see from this poster of the movie that various key figures uh, are depicted by actors here, including Joseph Stalin and Winston Churchill. And in the middle there, you have with the uh, Guomindang cap, uh, He Yingqin, commander of Chinese forces. But Chiang Kai-shek doesn't make an appearance. Instead, that figure in the middle, of course, is Mao Zedong. And you'll remember, if you look back at the picture, that Mao Zedong does not appear anyway in Cairo, because he was in a cave in Yan'an at the time uh, as part of the uh, communist resistance. He did not go anywhere near Cairo. And so when people on the Chinese internet saw this movie, uh, sorry, saw this poster in 2015, they got pretty angry, uh, or at least they got pretty excited and kind of sarcastic about the enthusiasm of the, the propaganda um, authorities, I guess, to pressure the movie makers into putting Mao Zedong onto this poster as opposed to uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek. And as a result, the Chinese internet came up with a whole variety of alternative uh, posters not uh, of other people who had also not been in uh, China, sorry, not been in Cairo during that conference in 1943, ranging there from Saddam Hussein to Kim Jong-un to Barack Obama uh, to uh, Jack Ma. In other words, there's a certain amount of sarcasm in China about an attempt to try and make this into too much of a propaganda exercise and not enough of a historical exercise at that, uh, at that time. My point being that although it's very clear that the Chinese authorities do use this type of world, this type of World War II history, including events such as the Cairo Declaration, to um, uh, to um, make their own case in terms of territorial and maritime claims in the present day. It's also the case that the wider Chinese public doesn't always buy the kind of more propagandistic, bombastic elements of this sort of message, and when they're not censored, are quite capable of sarcastic, sardonic responses, rather like these um, fake movie posters that you, see, uh, that you see here. Nonetheless, there is a continuing sense that drawing on aspects of that kind of heroic story of World War II, even though it involves having to acknowledge the contribution of the Gomida, as well as the CCP, which is historically accurate, politically problematic for today's CCP, hasn't stopped today's China from drawing on a whole variety of ideas from history that enable it to uh, make a, a kind of wider, bigger case that China today should get certain concessions, both internationally and domestically, because of the sacrifices that it made back in the 1940s, just as the United States, it would argue, continues to have a role in the Asia of today because of the sacrifices that the US made back in the 1940s as well. And... We've seen in recent years a very strong cultural turn towards using aspects of that World War II history to burnish contemporary Chinese nationalism. One good example from uh, 3rd of September 2015, uh, nearly uh, well, about six and a half years ago, I guess, is this massive victory parade in Tiananmen Square. The only parade to date in history of that kind of size and prominence in Tiananmen Square, the symbolic heart of Chinese government that commemorates an event, the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II in Asia, commemorates an event that was not directly to do either with the history of the People's Republic of China or the history of the Chinese Communist Party 
itself. So that shows quite how how broad the interest was in World War II within the party uh, itself when they authorised a parade of this side, uh, this size, and this this prominence. And it's worth noting that during the middle of the, uh, the parade, amongst the wartime veterans who were presented to Xi Jinping, who of course was presiding over the whole thing, um, half of them were communist veterans and half were nationalist Komida veterans, and that was something relatively unusual, or very unusual, actually, in terms of such a high-profile event in uh, in China. So aside of how World War II and the memory of World War II has changed some of the kind of wider collective narrative elements of Chinese propaganda. Other elements of China's contemporary uh, uh, political claims also draw from that period. Uh, you'll all be aware, I'm sure, that the South China Sea continues to be a hugely contested area. China makes a claim over almost all the waters of the South China Sea. Other neighboring Southeast Asian countries, the Philippines, Vietnam, amongst them, push back very strongly and argue that only a small amount of the maritime territory is China's and that other Southeast Asian countries also have, have a role. But what's sometimes forgotten is that back in 1947, before the communist victory, during the time when the Guomindang was still very much in power, they were at the forefront of initiating some of the ideas that had been taken up by the Communist Party itself in terms of initiating the idea of what's called the 11 dash line, a kind of mark on a map that marks a very expansive view of China's territory. So yet again, another example of how today's Chinese Communist Party, when it wants to, is quite prepared to take the claims and arguments made by its predecessor, the Kuomintang, and use them as if it were its own, even though it continues to condemn the Kuomintang for its governance over China. And sometimes some of the language goes a bit wrong. And here's an example of what I'm talking about here. When the Belt and Road Initiative, you'll be aware this is a huge multi billion dollar attempt to bring uh, infrastructural payments to large parts of uh, Europe, Southeast Asia, Middle East, and even East Africa. For a while, that Belt and Road Initiative was being called the Marshall Plan of China, and some quite prominent Chinese. Uh, commentators actually use this term, referring to the post-war plan to uh, reconstruct Europe, initiated by then Secretary of State George C. Marshall. But very quickly, the Chinese authorities, and most of the propaganda institutions, quickly pushed this idea back, saying, no, the Belt and Road Initiative is not a Marshall Plan from China. And this puzzled a lot of people, because actually the Marshall Plan, you know, regarded by most Westerners as a pretty favorable event, and for China to get the free publicity from others of using this term and being complimented by it, which most of them would have seen like a win. But not from the point of view of the Chinese Communist Party, which associated the man in the picture, General Marshall, not with the Marshall Plan, not with being the general who helped to win World War II, but rather as the man who had unsuccessfully tried to negotiate a peace in 1946 in China between the Kuomintang, the nationalists, and the Chinese communists and failed to do so. They saw him basically as a kind of Cold War operator. So associating this massive economic and social program uh, spending under the Belt and Road Initiative with General George Marshall was something the Chinese propaganda authorities were not prepared to do, even though in objective terms, it might have provided a rather favorable nickname or favorable framework from China's point of view, that the desire to push back against um, what they perceived as a Cold War enemy of China, was still too strong. So let me, as I come to the, the end of my sort of spoken comments, get ready for questions, come around again to just say why this term China's good war is one that I find useful. So the overall argument I want to make is that the traumatic experience of World War II, the millions of deaths and injuries and so forth, nonetheless helped to create a narrative which, once you get past the era of Chairman Mao, when talking about the Kuomintang, who did most of the fighting, was no longer uh, a taboo, has meant that over the last 30 to 40 years, there's been a much bigger uptick in the uh, way in which China's public culture, including those parts of the public culture controlled by the party very directly, has chosen to try and push forward the idea of World War II as a period when Chinese people stuck together across party lines and fought back against an invader. And that's why the term good war 
comes up, because originally it was used by the American oral historian Studs Terkel talking about the US involvement in World War II in Asia and elsewhere as a good war. It was meant even then as an ironic term, because of course the war wasn't at all good for those who fought through it and those who suffered under it. But rather the idea of creating a narrative that this was a war that had to be fought, in other words, fighting for the forces of democracy against the forces of dictatorship and darkness. And I would suggest that for China, they have also taken ideas of World War II and used them to create their own myth of the good war. In other words, a time just out of historical memory, 75, 80, 85 years ago, when essentially China was invaded and fought back against the invaders to create its own state. And that's why from the point of view of China, which has few other modern historical examples of events that it can draw on to create a sense of national unity. Remember, events like the Opium Wars just seem like defeat, and events like the Cultural Revolution are far too traumatic in terms of their internal memory to be able to, uh, to, to use those. So World War II kind of stands out as an example of how China can create a specific example of a very, very traumatic, relatively recent historical event that could be used to create a present day sense of unity and patriotism. And that's the reason that from that point of view, the Second World War, it has become a sort of good war in terms of the image it projects for the China of today. So let me leave my thoughts and comments there and hand over back to, to Joseph. I think it is his chairing and we can have some Q&A. Thank you so much for that um, amazing lecture, Dr. Mesa. Uh, we are uh, going to open up the question to Q&A. And actually, I would like to start by a question that a friend, a colleague of mine uh, mentioned to me yesterday. And I was, because I was selling the panel to him uh, and really urging him to come, he asked me the question of, um, you know, because of World War II, 17 years from now, or 15 years from now in China, World War II, it would have been 100 years since the start of World War II. It felt, it feels so distant in the past and almost in everyday life in China, no one really talks about World War II uh, and a traumatic experience that China went through, uh, apart occasionally from a very nationalistic uh, post that you see on Weibo or social media. So he was failing to see the point, he was really struggling to see the point of uh, attending a lecture when when the history seems to be so distant in the past. And I, was, I wasn't I was able to kind of offer a very good counter argument and I was wondering if you uh, have a few words to say on, on that subject. Sure. Well, I can tell him that uh, if he can't be able to get out of bed on a Sunday morning, then at least he can uh, get on Amazon and download a copy of the book. <laughs> he, can he can read it between his bed sheets. I think that's fair to uh, say. Then he can uh, uh, do that too. But anyway, I send greetings even to those who can't be bothered to get out of bed. Um, yeah. Well, I would say that um, if you if it, World War Two is all around you in China, if you know where to look, um, if you look at the wide range of people who are still fighting Warfen versus Malfen, you know, pro Guomindang versus pro Mao. Um, viewpoints on social media, they are quite often drawing on a whole variety of different understandings of what actually happened in World War II as a means of actually fighting present day ideological battles in the same way that when Americans are talking about whether to um, bring back uh, Confederate soldier statues or not, they're not really talking about the Civil War in the sense of what actually happened in the 1860s. They're talking about battles over identity and politics and indeed race in present day US circumstances um, that use those statues and use those history as a tool, as a framework to express what's going on. For anyone who thinks that World War II doesn't much matter uh, in Chinese popular culture today, they obviously never either go watch TV or go to the movies. Uh, in the year 2020, when the pandemic was hitting hard, the biggest box office movie in the world was uh, Baba, 800, the 800. The, uh, movie was a massive box office hit in China, the only country in the world that actually had mm -hmm. movie theaters open during that year, I think, in fact, um, which made $300 million at the Chinese box office. And the subject was Wuomindang soldiers taking a last stand in 1937 mm -hmm. against the Japanese um, uh, invaders. And it provoked a lot of controversy, just again to make it even clearer why this matters. In the summer of 2020, it was a big, big hit that made a lot of money. One year earlier, just one year earlier, that film had been banned in China, it was going to be the film that opened the Shanghai International Film Festival. And then three days before, I think two days even, before it was supposed to be shown in huge IMAX format, it was just pulled and censored for the best part of a year because there were people within the leadership who said, 
this aspect of World War II, which the Kuomintang are shown to the fore, cannot be shown in the 70th year of the anniversary of the PRC. So for anyone who thinks that World War II doesn't matter in terms of contemporary Chinese politics, I'd refer them to the top leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. Just one more example. Um, I don't know how much you guys are all watching Chinese uh, TV, but uh, again, not, la not last year, but the year before that, uh, the biggest series, if not one of the biggest series, perhaps one of the two or three biggest uh, drama series on Chinese TV in terms of viewers was Chiltran, uh, the uh, Autumn Cicada, which is a big 49-part series spy thriller set, in fact, in wartime Hong Kong uh, under underground communist agents just before Pearl Harbor. Now, you may say what you like about the script, although the acting is pretty good. The script is quite propagandistic. It's obviously meant as a kind of powerful symbol to the Hong Kong uh, democracy movement. In other words, the Chinese Communist Party put huge amounts of money into a TV series set during World War II, saying this is what patriotic Hong Kong has looked like, not you. Now, many people possibly in your audience may agree or disagree with that. I'm you know, saying that that's out there for you to look at. The point is that over and over again, when it comes to trying to send out messages about the present day, it is World War II and China's presence in World War II in all sorts of often quite controversial areas that the authorities, that the movie makers, that the social media types, that the video game makers turn to over and over again to say something not about wartime history, but about where China is today and where it's going to go into the, uh, the, 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 the future. So I'd say to uh, your friend who's in bed, once he's out of there, look a little harder. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, I believe we have one question from the audience. Uh, yes, please. Yes, um, thank you for the insightful presentation. Um, I think, unfortunately, Western discussions of World War II don't often focus on the Pacific, and maybe when they do, it usually has to do with the experiences of the United States. So my question is, um, to what extent can China influence international narratives when people outside of China um, seem to either not know or not really care enough about China's recent history? Thanks very much for a great uh, question. I think your use of the word specific is a really important one because it, 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 it does stress the importance of bringing about detail into the question, understanding what's going on. I do discuss this question actually quite a lot in the, uh, in, in, in the book. And um, I think it is going to be a tricky one for China to undertake because essentially what you're asking about, I think, is a version of this now very long-standing debate on what's called soft power. In other words, can countries and societies find ways to create images of themselves that can persuade rather than coerce other actors in the world to do what they want. And this, in a slightly crude, but you know, not entirely inaccurate way, has surrounded the United States, you know, with people arguing that during the Cold War, the most important weapon that the United States had was not nuclear weapons or NATO or you know, large armies, but Coca-Cola and blue jeans and Hollywood movies and all the things that gave an impression of America as a place to emulate or support. I don't think China has so far done a terribly helpful job of that. And I think World War II is, is part of the problem. In a general sense, I think that China has so far managed to create a pretty successful overall, I mean, with lots of exceptions, but overall, a not, you know, unsuccessful um, image of itself as a country that has undertaken poverty alleviation. You know, we had this sort of awful food common prosperity agenda. We're hearing a bit less about it recently, but for a long time, in the last few months, that was a kind of big argument being used within China by the, the party that look, this is a kind of attempt to try and create a new kind of Xiao Kang, you know, the moderately prosperous society. All of this is a dialogue between, you know, the Chinese leadership, the Chinese people, obviously censored, obviously in some ways controlled, but nonetheless through social media and elsewhere, an internal conversation. But very little of that internal conversation has much purchase elsewhere. Uh, the fact that China is becoming, you know, richer or poorer or more or less equal has not become a story that the Chinese authorities have yet found any very convincing way to tell to an outside audience as being important to, uh, to, to them. And I'll just say a word or two more if, I may, uh, more, if I may, about why I think World War II, in a weird way, is not being helpful in terms of China's international image as opposed to its domestic image. At home, movies like Barbai, movies um, and video games and so forth uh, about the war of resistance against Japan, as it's known in China, do do quite a lot, I think, to keep the idea of the war as this sort of important element shaping national identity. 
But most of that doesn't have much external purchase. And I, I think there are a lot of reasons, but I'll just give you one. Think about most of the most inspiring Western Second World War movies, or certainly American ones in particular, uh, whether it's TV series like Band of Brothers or um, you know, The Pacific, which we saw there at the beginning, or in the Frank Capra movies, the 1940s, or kind of um, movies about Pearl Harbor, whatever it might be. The overall message, whether it's explicit or, explicit or implicit, is that America suffered terribly. But what came through that, through the blood and tears and treasure, was a world, at least the part where the Americans had some influence, which was democratic and free in a way that it wasn't before. Now, you know, I know, and everyone in this audience knows, there's lots of flaws to that story. If you're living in parts of East Asia or large parts of Latin America during the Cold War, American influence did not make you very free if you were living under some of those military dictatorships. In Western Europe, yes, I think that's fair enough. In North America, yes, that's fair enough. But nonetheless, the mythos, the, the kind of the narrative is created and reinforced by those movies about the purpose of World War II. Uh, you know, Frank Capra's idea of fighting uh, for a democracy. It has a real resonance to it, even if there are plenty of hypocrisies and flaws. So switch to China's story. Put very, very simplistically, I know this is too simple, but all the same, nobody can or should deny the horrific suffering that China went through during World War II and its contributions to winning the war, including holding down over half a million uh, Japanese, uh, uh, Japanese troops. But today's China, while it has its own internal political discussion about whether or not the system works or not, has been unable really to portray itself as being a model for that many other places in a kind of direct sense. It almost says because we have you know, the Chinese, uh, Chinese characteristics to our own uh, situation or, or system. Having a movie about World War II, which basically says that China's sacrifices during World War II, which were huge, were basically making the world safe for a kind of developmentalist welfare authoritarianism. Let's just say it doesn't sound nearly as good as making the world safe for democracy. It's not a message that transmits very well. And for that reason, I think the use of soft power through World War II, as through other aspects of what China's doing, is going to be a much, much harder path than it was for the Americans during the Cold War. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have a question from the audience. Um, so I'm paraphrasing the question. Uh, as, as young people in, in Taiwan increase, increasingly distance themselves from the mainland, is there any hope for a peaceful reunification? Uh, so that's the question. Um, I remember asking actually someone I know a little bit uh, for the think tank in Beijing on, on Zoom or one of the video links a while ago, a version of this question, which is yeah. in a slightly different way, which is this. Almost all of the discourse that's come from uh, the mainland side in recent years has been about how China reserves the option to create a, um, uh, you know, to, to use force if necessary for unification with, with Taiwan. And the question I asked my friend in Beijing was slightly different, which is, what do you think is the most attractive option you in Beijing could offer Taiwan mm. to persuade them that unification would be a good idea even to start talking about, mm. as opposed to threatening? And he looked back, he's a very honest guy, and said, the answer to that question is one of the things that keeps me awake at night, <laughs> because he didn't have a very good answer to it. And I think there you see part of the issue. And again, you know, the, 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 the comparisons elsewhere in the world are, are quite indicative. There are lots of things that you can potentially gain through military means, but they're not easy and they don't always come in the way you think they're going to. And there's always a question of what happens today after. So in the case of Taiwan, first of all, I think most military strategists who've looked at the Taiwan situation and know what it would be like to launch an amphibious attack on the beaches what it would be like to have to try and organize this kind of cyber war, essentially isolate that. You know, these are big things that would have to be flagged up in advance in most cases. They involve a certain amount of technological and military capacity. It's not to say that China couldn't do it, but it needs more time. And the question is, well, supposing you do that, what then? So I would say that, you know, if I knew the answer to this question, I would be a lot more powerful than I am, which is fortunately for everyone not, not powerful at all. But there needs to be some sort of serious discussion in which it's understood that destabilization 
of the Asia Pacific region could be in military security and economic terms one of the most devastating things that could happen to the world in the next few years. And it would make the Ukraine war look like, you know, a minor ripple, even though the Ukraine war is already kind of causing everything from huge human devastation and death to economic um, problems through uh, energy supply problems, uh, inflation and, and so forth. Well, multiply that by any number of times for what disruption in the Asia Pacific region would cause. And China, I think, knows that as much as anyone else in the region does. The Japanese certainly are aware of it and they're making their signals more and more clear from Tokyo. They regard the autonomy of Taiwan and also the stability of the region as absolutely key goals in that particular sense. So making sure that stability is maintained in the Asia Pacific region, I think has to be the very, very first um, element of what is done. But there also has to be a very strong concentration on values and understanding that people, you know, as we're seeing elsewhere in the world, including in Ukraine, that people don't just operate on the basis of what makes them rich. They have ideas about themselves, and that's as true in China as it is in Taiwan, as it is in Japan, as it is in the United States. And but understanding where people are coming from, understanding a bit where their soft power is generated, is also the first part of the discussion. And thinking yourself into the minds of the people on the other side and thinking, if we were them, what would we think? If you don't have a clear answer to that question, then you need to stop and step back and think about it, because that's the first part of understanding where successful diplomacy comes from. Thank you, sir. Uh, I actually have a question myself, because um, in my family, I've always been quite interested interested in history, and I was, uh, especially after going to school, I went to college. I started nagging my grandmother about uh, the history of China. Oh, did, you, did, you say, did you say Winchester College? Yeah. Um, oh, that's right. I've never thinks. Yes, so I'm speaking to you from Winchester, UK, at the moment. Now, in fact, I can see the Winchester Cathedral just out of the window from where I am. Oh, really. I can, yeah. I'm just um, looking out over the cathedral close. It's Easter today, as you know, so there have been some lovely church bell ringing going on uh, right here. And yeah, I, I, I miss Winchester so much. I want to go back. Um, it's looking lovely today. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I dropped your question. <laughs> I was talking to my grandmother about the legacies of World War II and especially what happened during the Nanjing uh, massacre. And it took a f five years to really open up what her parents went through during the war. And I do feel like there's a huge sentiment during that generation to avoid any topic because, because it was so traumatic. And they really want to avoid talking about the history and, and what exactly happened during that period. And I do feel like there is a difference between that sentiment and uh, sentiments among uh, people who went through World War II elsewhere um, for other segments of um, the population at least. And, uh, and I'm wondering what's causing this sort of difference. Um, is it solely based on trauma? Or do you think there is uh, um, sort of a feeling of safety by not talking about uh, this really horrific uh, event, um, sort of pressured by uh, the Chinese government in a way? Um, uh, do you mean sort of a difference for people who lived through that in China as opposed to, say, in Britain or in the United States? Exactly. In the yeah. Past China. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I think you put your finger on it. Um, yes, I think it is more difficult. Or rather, let me put it a different way. Of all the allied powers that were on the winning side, I think it is China that has found it hardest to talk about what happened during that period. More so than the Soviet Union, which was perhaps the, the place because of censorship and political repression, where aspects of that story were, were difficult to talk about. But overall, it still became part of the national narrative. Mm -hmm. And for a long time in China, it didn't. And I think that the, the major reason that it became so problematic, and I yeah. explored this in some detail in the book, is that so much of the Chinese victory was dependent on the Guomindang nationalists mm -hmm. um, and their armies and their government, who then had to be cast into absolute political darkness after 1949. It was impossible under Mao Zedong to, um, you know, say anything very much other than a very, very vague and minor sense that gave any kind of positive assessment of the uh, Kuomintang contribution to defeating the war. And the problem was that very large numbers of people, millions and millions and millions of Chinese, had lived under the Kuomintang, not under the communists, during World War II. So the city of Chongqing, the temporary wartime capital of China between 1937 and 1946, was an example of a city that had you know, suffered hugely, air raids, uh, you know, uh, disease, um, uh, food shortages, all of this during those years. 
but you know, again, I interviewed one of the quite prominent local historians in, in the book. He said that they could tell stories about air raids and so forth privately at home, very quietly, but they couldn't commemorate them publicly. They couldn't write about them in newspapers until the 1980s or 90s or, or beyond. So there was a very deliberate suppression of the memory of that period. And I think some of it found its, its manifestation in some other quite horrific ways during the Cultural Revolution. One of the places where the Cultural Revolution was most savage was Sichuan province, uh, in and around Chengdu, Chongqing, and those cities. And although there are a lot of reasons for that, one, I think, was the repression for a very long time of talking about the horrors that had been suffered during World War II in China, and particularly those who had been affiliated with the Guomindang, who then, after 1949, were told that their suffering and their traumas didn't matter, and that essentially they should shut up about it. And the moment the Cultural Revolution gave people a chance not just not to shut up, yeah. to scream and shout and smash everything up, that's what they did. Thank you for that answer. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. Sure. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, another country that's been making claims to concession based on World War II sacrifices is Russia. Is there a slippery slope to China's use of the past to present gains? How should accusations of expansionism be perceived? Um, yes, I mean, there is a slippery slope. One of the most dangerous metaphors, metaphors to weak work that really has been used by the current Russian government is the idea that it's uh, violent and willful and utterly illegal invasion of Ukraine is a process of, quote, denazification. Um, you know, the, the idea that the uh, president of Ukraine, who is in fact, of course, of Jewish heritage, um, could be a Nazi is, you know, obscene in and of itself. So the use of inappropriate World War II metaphors is something we see right before our eyes going on at the moment in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, China has not done that or, or anything particularly close to it. I, I think it's absolutely fair to, to say. But I think that since time is limited and sort of try and focus, focus the answer in, in a particular way, I would say the following. I think that there is a great deal of justification for the wider world acknowledging much more than it ever has the sacrifices that China did make, even though it's 75 or 80 years ago. It's a long time, just outside living memory, perhaps, but just inside it for a few people. But nonetheless, acknowledging that contribution is a very significant one to the Allied war victory, I think, is long overdue. So I would absolutely support that. What I don't buy is the argument that that on its own gives any actor, whether it's the United States or China or others, um, an automatic right to infinite levels of you know, maritime or territorial rights or authority in its own backyard or elsewhere. One of the reasons, which is the major reason why the United States is still a major player in East Asia, is because democratic publics have repeatedly voted for governments that support alliances with the United States, the US-Japan Treaty Alliance, the States of Forces Agreement in the Philippines, the uh, troop, um, state, troop station in South Korea, uh, there's three examples at the top of my head. You can find half a dozen others if you, if you wanted to. Singapore, another, another good one. China, for the most part, has not been terribly successful at finding ways to get democratic publics to support its presence. So there are exceptions possibly emerging like, like the New Deal with the Solomon Islands out in the, in the Pacific. But overall, while the World War II experience gives a kind of background of historical moral legitimacy, which I think does have something to it, it's not enough in itself. You also need to bring about the, I would say, democratic consent of publics in other parts of the region, East Asia, Southeast Asia, to be able to continue that legacy in the present day. And for the most part, the United States has done it. And for the most part, China has been quite slow to learn that, learn that lesson, although I think it's trying to use economic and trade and commercial means rather than necessarily purely democratic means to do it in the in the present day. And that's the direction that things may turn in the next few years. Thank you so much. I believe that's the end of the uh, uh, conference today. Um, if you could stay, uh, there will be a 10 minute break and they will come back for the next conference. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Miller, for coming. And um, if you could join us, join me in uh, thanking Dr. Miller. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure with you today. And do enjoy the rest of your, your, your Sunday. Thank you.